Well, I'm Dr. John Turk Logan, and uh, the, the name Turk came from my grandmother when I was born, George. She said, he looks like a little turkey, and I was born on Thanksgiving Day, uh, November 23rd, 1948, so the name Turk kind of stuck with me as a nickname, but it's actually John Charles Logan, Jr. When I started in radio in 1971, I was kind of thrust into the studio and Clay Collins, the program director at the time, said, well, what name are you going to use? And I thought that John would be a little bit boring, the John Logan Show, so I just used my nickname, Turk Logan, and it stuck for the last 44 years. So, Turk, how did you become aware of the Funk Center? Well, my story goes all the way back to where I was four years old, George, and um, every um, Saturday morning, my mother would get up and run uh, the vacuum cleaner on the tapestry carpet. We lived on a little street called Com Street right off of Germantown. And um, I would listen to that vacuum cleaner. I would turn the sound down on the TV and listen and travel. I wouldn't go to sleep, but I would travel. They call it white noise today, there, and they use it for their therapeutic measures. And I would travel to concerts and DJs, and I guess a lot of that had to do with American Bandstand. And as the years went on, I kept it in my head and uh, had the opportunity to start working at WDAO in 1971 based on um, what I had in my head when I was four years old. I changed my career when I was about seven because I wanted to be an astronaut. And I wrote Eisenhower a letter because Russia had just sent Sputnik up. And I asked him to get into the space program. I was seven, eight years old. And Eisenhower wrote me back. He said, Dear John, thank you for your interest in the space program. At first, I suggest you get out of grade school. And then you go to high school. And then you go to college. And then you go to graduate school. And after that, if you're good enough, you can apply to the NASA space program. So I got my calculator out and said, man, I'll be 20 years old. That's too old. So I went back to being a, a disc jockey. We used to listen to a guy by the name of Gene Berry back in the 50s. And Gene had a show at WING called The Berry Go Round. And he played black music. And who would have thought that when I started in radio in 19... 71, and Gene would be my first program director, and who would have thought in 2009 that we would both be inducted into the Dayton Area Broadcasters Hall of Fame, him posthumously, of course, and, and me, 50 years later. So with the Funk Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center, it, it, it's all kind of falling in place with the master plan that I had back in the uh, 70s of introducing funk music, which wasn't real popular around the country back then, only because of the word funk. And the word funk was so close to the other F word that the owner of the station, Bud Crow, if you said, man, that's funky, he might have thought he heard the other word. And he was at his radio station. He owned the station then. And he was there. And he would walk in the studio while you were on air and say, what did you say, young man? And you would have to stop and give him an explanation while you were on the radio. So the, the Funk and Exhibition Center uh, with, with you and, and, and David Webb and everything is falling into place. We need it here in, in Ohio, in America, in Dayton, Ohio. And I'm just excited to be a part of the, 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 the growing. So what is your role with the Funk Center? Well, David called me a couple months ago, and we just hit it off. Uh, I knew of David, but I had not met David personally. And we just talked like we had known each other for years. He has that kind of personality, and, and so do I. And he asked me to become a, a board member and a, a volunteer for the organization, which I'm happy to do because 
I, like I said, it fits in what I've been doing with my, with my plan in the music business. This is my 44th year in broadcasting this month, and it fits exactly with what uh, I had planned. And, and, and there's some other people involved, like yourself and David and, and other people, Stephanie and, and Marcia and other people involved in the, um, this organization to help it grow. Now, with that said, how will you use your position and skills to help the Funk Center achieve its goals? Well, I have a, a lot of contacts, obviously. I know a lot of people in the industry. Uh, I own a radio station, WTRK. Uh, that was one of my goals and one of my, my, my lifetime ambitions is to own my own radio station. I put WTRK on the radio in 2010. Uh, we are now five years old. We have 33,000 listeners. Uh, we have listeners worldwide. It's an internet radio station and it's global. So I'll use that radio station to promote the Funk Museum and Exhibition Center to let people know what's going on, things that we're doing. The same type of interview that you and I will do, uh, I'll do on my radio station with other people, including David and uh, just keep the word out there, that's one thing, and, and make contacts, and also work with you guys uh, in your fundraising area. And education, what hasn't been discussed is I own a broadcasting school, the Academy of Broadcasting. It's a broadcasting school that trains people effectively in the field of communication. And when I use the word effectively, that just means when I'm talking to you, you understand what I'm saying. So there's gonna be an education component uh, in the organization, I'm told uh, that's going to be introduced. There's an entertainment component, obviously, and I have a strong background in that as well. Will you use social media to increase awareness also? Well, you know, the Internet is social media. My, my radio station is social media. I own um, um, four uh, Facebook pages and I utilize them for my business. I created a cyber mall, and that's a mall that's on the internet, and I use them to promote the different businesses that I, that I run. And so I can do that as well. So um, social media, as far as Facebook is concerned, uh, as far as my radio station is concerned, and all the red LinkedIn, Twitter, all the rest of the uh, social media that's out there, we'll get that word out as far as um, what we're doing with the Funk Museum and Exhibition Center. So let's go way back in time now. All right. Let's get some history out the way. Okay. Give me a little history, as if I didn't know, on the Dayton Funk Sound and groups that came from here. Well, it, the history is that I grew up in the music era in Dayton, Ohio. And many of the guys that I'm going to talk about, when we were in grade school, Tom Shelby, uh, Junie Morrison, a few other guys, um, had groups. And these groups were very, very talented. Of course, they emulated the Temptations and groups of, of the era. But they were so talented. I can't sing, and I don't dance very well. But I had to figure out a way to get into the business. I mean, because one way, that it was a great way to meet young ladies. <laughs> I mean, you know, but since I don't sing and dance, I, I mean, I was, I was handicapped. And so watching these guys from grade school to high school, like I said, I had to figure out a way. And the blessing came in 1964 when WDAO radio came on the air in October 1964. I was a fresh, freshman at Roosevelt High School. And the light came on because, remember, I told you I go back to four years old with this. And so now it's becoming more in the focus, a black radio station and a young man who wants to be in the business, even though I didn't have a job and, and didn't get into the business. And I went to a, a, a school and got my third class license. And haphazardly, I was standing in the arcade reading the centerfold of a Playboy magazine. And back then, you didn't shrink wrap the magazine. It was in the arcade in downtown Dayton. And a young lady, a black lady and a uh, photographer walked up to me. This is a true story and said, excuse me, sir, we're doing interviews as to what turns you on. 
And she said, what turns you on? And I started laughing. And I looked down at the magazine and raised up and said, radio broadcasting. I wanted to say something that made a little sense. And I said, radio broadcasting. And I had my third class license. A few weeks later, an article came out in the Dayton Daily News. John Charles Logan Jr., nicknamed Turk, uh, has a third class FCC license looking for a job in radio. WDAO called me up. And I left Fridge there and, and um, started. And when I finally got the opportunity to be on the air, I was in the All Night Show. And in the All Night Show, there was not a lot of, in 1971, there was not a lot of commercials. So consequently, I could play a lot of different music. I could play Earth, Wind and Fire and Zanzibar. I could play By the Time You Get to Phoenix, Isaac Hayes. I could play uh, Stop, Buck and Dance by the Crusaders, funky songs. Um, you couldn't, you wouldn't play those songs in daytime programming. One, they were too long, and secondly, the funk hadn't really caught on at the time in the, in the early 70s. And so over the years from 1971 to 74, we developed the funk music with groups like the Isley Brothers, with groups like James Brown, um, Earth, Wind & Fire, the OJs. I mean, they, they, you know, for the love of m money, funk. Well, the artists, the black artists in Dayton, Ohio, I knew because, like I said, we had grown up together. These guys now had bands, um, and a lot of them had records. And so the things that they didn't have, they weren't on Billboard 100, and they didn't have record deals. So consequently, the radio stations weren't going to play their music, okay? And so it kind of left them in a kind of an oxymoron to a certain degree. They had all this talent, but nobody would touch the music. And so I sit down with management, Bud Crow, who owned the radio station, uh, Joe Whalen, who was the general manager, and John Jay, who was the station manager, said, look, we have an opportunity to serve the community. That's what radio stations are licensed for in the community, to serve the community. And this is an opportunity to expose local black artists to the airwaves. And the first thing they said to me, well, the guys don't have record deals and they're not on Billboard. Why do we want to play their music? Now, if I had to sit because it's funky and it's good music, it would have went right over their head. So I had to take another approach. And the approach I took worked. We wanted to test it. Junie Morrison, who I went to high school with, brought me a song called Pain. And I played that pain, that song called Pain, and man, it was pure funk. And it started to make some noise in, in the industry. Remember, WDAO was a big 50,000 watt FM radio station with a three state coverage, so we had over a million listeners. And the owner of the station wasn't going to risk just playing any kind of music on his radio station. And so we played Pain, and then shortly after that, a guy by the name of Satch brought me a song called, a name, called Fire. And fire just took off like fire, and then roller coaster ride and sweet sticky thing, and and the Ohio players, the Ohio Untouchables became the Ohio players. And then a guy by the name of Larry Trotman brought me a song called Freedom, and he asked me to do the liner notes on it. And I was excited because again I was starting to, to gain some popularity. I was now music director in in 1975, and then program director in 1976. And the highest rating at the time was an eight share of the market, and that was a good share, a great share for a black radio station to have, and that was in the ratings. And then uh, shortly after, Larry brought me Freedom, and we played it. Uh, Roger signed with Warner Brothers, and More Bounce to the Ounce came out. It went double platinum, and it put him on the map. Uh, shortly after that, a buddy of mine from L.A., by the name of Dick Griffey, called me, said he was coming in to sign a group called Lakeside out of Dayton, Ohio. Dick Griffey was a former professional football player and uh, owned Solar Records, which was the sound of Los Angeles Records. He signed Lakeside. Shortly after that, a group called Slave uh, had brought me a cassette because they heard of all the things we were doing at WDAO. I sent the cassette to the president of Cotillion Records, Henry Allen, Henry listened to it in his car, pulled over to the side of the road as he was on his way to play golf, and signed Slave right over the phone. They had their first big hit called Slide. It went gold. 
uh, one of the uh, most intriguing artists that I worked with was a guy by the name of Johnny Wilder Jr. And Johnny Wilder had come in from London, England, even though being from Dayton, Ohio, had a group called Heat Wave and gave me the album Too Hot to Handle. I took that album home and listened to it and fell in love with it. And this was in 1976. In 1977, CBS Records flew me to London, England to their convention. They signed Heat Wave there. We had been playing the album for a year. They repackaged it and sent it back to me a second time. And like I said, I had been playing it with that big hit always and forever on it. And then there was a group that came out of Dayton, Ohio, uh, with a guy that, that I know you're working with, Keith Harrison. He had a group called Fazo, and they had a big hit called Riding High, and we played that. And then there was Byron Bird with his group called Sun. He had a big hit called Sun Is Here, and it was Shadow and groups called Platypus, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of the things, my mission at WDAO as program director, as the boss, was to serve the community and also was to serve the black artists, to help black artists get records played on the airways because um, it was very hard for them to get records played around the industry. But once WDAO started to play it, and get national, get national recognition, uh, then everything else fell into play. But this sound was defining at the time, and it's still used today, you know, like sampling and stuff. Right. But like the Wright brothers, like you mentioned, people don't know it came from here. What are we going to do about that? Well, again, it, it, it's marketing, 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 PR, 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 letting people know um, locally, letting people know regionally, letting people know uh, nationally, and letting people know um, internationally. To give you an example, I mentioned earlier that um, we had a rating of an eight share of the market when I was on the air WDAO. I was at WDAO from 1971 to 1983. When I left WDAO, our rating was a 20.7 share of the market. That's the highest ratings in the history of radio ever. It has never been accomplished and achieved since then. Now, if every black person in the city of Dayton was listening to WDAO during this prime time, we would never get more than an eight share of the market. That's the max. Where the rest of the ratings come from? So we need to make sure that the general market understands about the funk music. I hear them talk about it on Inside Edition and, and Entertainment Tonight, but they don't associate it with Dayton, Ohio. They just talk about it in general. And they should associate it with Dayton, Ohio, just like when they talk about the Wright brothers, they associate it with Dayton, Ohio. You got big Wright Patterson Air Force Base sitting out there. So we need to make sure that we constantly get the word out to, uh, to the world about where this came from, how it came, and, um, and what's going on with it today, because that's why this museum is so important, because we are doing it the correct way to make sure when our children get a piece of this history, they get the history correct. Because all of us aren't going to be here forever, but we want to leave the right legacy behind when my grandchildren come to the museum and say, oh, that's Grandpa there, you know, and uh, when he goes to the uh, the convention center and sees grandpa's picture on the wall from the hall of fame they understand that's part of grandpa's legacy something grandpa did uh, when he was still when he was around so i, I you know I, i'm excited um I'm, I'm i'm ecstatic really because we're finally getting it done correctly and it's for everybody it's not just for black people it's not just for white people. It's for everybody in the city of Dayton, Ohio. When you get on the Wright Brothers plane, there's all kind of people on one of those planes that fly over Dayton, Ohio, okay? And even though these two engineers, when they did it back, when they did it over 100 years ago, I don't know what their plan was. But I do know when Paul Lawrence, if you look at the graduation picture from Steele High School with Wilbur and Orville Wright in it, you see this real dark figure and that person is Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and who is also a great legacy from Dayton, Ohio as well. They went to high school together. So 
we want to make sure that the history that we capture is the correct history. So a hundred years from now, when people are talking about the Dayton Funk and the Exhibition Center, they know exactly where it came from and how it came to fold. Well, without divulging too much, is there a plan moving forward? Yes, there's a plan moving forward. This is part of the plan. Um, David Webb, who I have to give credit to, is, has put an organization together and the organization is growing. He has a lot of ideas that fit right in the line with what I'm doing. One of the things that, that I did when I left WDAO and went to Central State in 1986, I designed the Cosby Center for Mass Communication. And the first thing I did when I walked in that radio station, which by the way was off the air, was ban rap music. And I took a position on rap music, okay? And I told all the kids that came through, Omarosa, Leandra, Ed Spillers, all these people that have been in broadcasting for almost 20 years now, that we don't play rap music here because violent music makes violent kids. I wrote a book about it. I researched it. I took a position on it in 1982 and went back to school and studied it and walked across stage and got an earned PhD in mass communication and popular culture as a result of that. And one of the things that I was very, very concerned about, and still am today, about lyric content put in our children's mind. And I tell children, I'll, I'll take a 15-year-old and I say, I'm going to say you a song. I'm not going to sing it, because I, like I said, I don't sing. I'm going to say you a song. And the song is, I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. And it's, the person is stopping thinking, me, so that's the Temptations, my girl, Dr. Logan. And I'm like, correct. I said, but you know nothing about that song. That song was recorded 40 years before you were born. I said, but every lyric that you've ever heard in rap music, even violent music, talking about blatant sex, drugs, and profanity, is in your subconscious. And it's always going to be there. It's never going to leave. You just, told, you just proved it to me when you said you listened to my girl. So consequently, uh, all of the things we're doing is falling in line with what I've been doing for for all my broadcast career. Absolutely amazing. So after all is said and done, and people come from miles around to Dayton, Ohio, what kind of experience do you want them to walk away with when they go home? I want them to walk away in awe because there's so many things that the artists have, the paraphernalia, like I said, when I left WDAO, I left with 52 gold and platinum records. I had to call the record company and ask them to stop putting my name on them because they were intimidating my jocks. Uh, when David came down to my house the other day, he saw some of the gold and platinum records on the wall from back in the day. And it's not just the Dayton groups. It's the OJs. It's Earth, Wind & Fire. It's Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. It's the Ohio Players. It's Roger, you know, and it goes on and on. And there's also a group that came out of Dayton, Ohio, that I didn't mention, called Dayton, D-A-Y-T-O-N. They had a big hit called The Sound of Music. They had another big hit called Hot Fun in the Summertime, a remake of Sly and the Family Stone. And Sean Sandridge, who was the group leader at the time, was just magnificent, Central State graduate, multi-talented guy, and just did magic in the studio. And so I want them to be able to take that away with them when they come in because the, the, the history that they will be taught comes from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, into 2000 and on into the future as we are today. Give me your fondest memory of back in the day in the infancy of funk music? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I was on the air at WDAO and I received a call from James Brown. And James Brown uh, asked me, did I have his latest song? And if you know anything about James Brown, all of James Brown's music was funky. And so I said, no, sir, Mr. Brown, and you never addressed him as James Brown. You always addressed him as Mr. Brown. I said, no, sir, Mr. Brown, I don't have your song. But you all you do is put it in the mail, and you know James' music was basically automatic. And um, he said, "What time do you get off the air?" I said, "Get off at five o'clock." He said, "Meet me at the airport." 
So I rounded my little friend up, little girlfriend at the time, another couple, and we drive out to the airport. We're supposed to meet James Brown at 7.30. 8 o'clock comes, 8.30, no James Brown. And then it dawns on me that James Brown has his own Learjet. So I'm in the wrong place. So we jump back in the car and drive around to, to Dayton International private side. And I asked the guy in the tower, do you have a James Brown coming in from LaGuardia? And he says no. So my friends say, okay, Turkey, pull one over on us. So now it's about 9.30. They're getting a little tired. We go back home. The couple goes on their way. My friend goes upstairs and she rolls her hair up and she, she's in for the night. About 10 o'clock I get a call. Turk, where are you? We're here at the airport. I jump back up, put my clothes on, get back in the car, drive back to the airport to the private side and here's this beautiful Learjet sitting out there. It's about 11 o'clock at night and it says JB on the side. Big bold letters. He said, come on, let's go. And I'm like, where are we going? He said, don't worry about it. It cost me four or $5,000 to put this plane in the air. So myself, James Brown, and two Arab pilots. And I said to, to, to Mr. Brown, I said, Mr. Brown, I know you're into this black thing. He said, don't even say it. I ain't found no brothers to fly this plane yet. This plane cost me $4 million. <laughs> yeah. And so I said, All right. I don't know where we went, but I do know we went someplace. When I came back, Staggered off the daggone plane. He gave me a song, and the name of that song was Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. You know, the, the, Nash, the Black National Anthem at the time. And, and that was one of my fondest memories. And like I said, uh, CBS Records, there, there's a thing in, in, in radio today called payola, plugola, and sexola. And all three of them can come at you at the same time, especially when you're in a position as music director or program director of a big radio station. And so we had to be very cautious to keep your career together of not taking any money from any of the artists. I mean, Junie would come down in the Rolls Royce and we'd go down to the Playboy Club in Cincinnati and Satch had that Excalibur and he'd come and pick me up. So management was just like, what is Turk doing? Wasn't doing anything. These guys were just friends of mine. We had known each other for years before even radio and it was, you know, they were happy that I was playing their records, but they, didn't, they couldn't give me anything. But CBS Records called me in July of 1977, invited me to go to London, England to their uh, record convention. So I went back and asked the general manager if it was okay. And he said, well, what about payola? I said, well, CBS says that the attorneys have worked everything out and you're not going to have to worry about that. So. I went to Chicago to get my um, passport. Phil Donahue was in Chicago at the time. This was before Oprah Winfrey. And um, visit Phil's show, because I had some friends that worked at Channel 2. And then got my passport. You can get your passport in four hours at the Federal Building in Chicago. Flew back, and the next week it was up, up, and away, London, England. And I spent six days in London, England at the CBS Record Convention in July of 1977, and it was where they gave all their gold and platinum records to their artists. And at the time, there was the OJs, there was Earth, Wind and Fire, there was uh, uh, George Duke, Stanley Clark, Barbara Streisand, Patti LaBelle, hit after hit after hit. So that was a fine time that I spent in London, England, six days. Uh, in London, England, and spent some, some good times with some great artists. Um, like I said, George Duke is no longer here, but George Duke was just, he performed, they had just come back from the Montreal Jazz Festival, and they performed, and it was just a great time. So, a lot of fond memories that, that we have. Last question. Mm -hmm. Why does the Funk Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center belong in the city of Dayton, Ohio? because that's where it originated at. That's where the funk originated, and that's why it belongs in Dayton, Ohio. Thank you, Dr. Turk Logan. You're welcome, George. Hey.